Welcome to your top rated global podcast that is your one stop shop for everything entrepreneurship, self development, and smart investment decisions. This podcast is hosted by owner, doctor, and creator Dustin Steffi. We are blessed to have accolades that include a 2022 nomination by the People's Podcast Awards in the category of business, money donated to two amazing causes, cystic fibrosis and the Boys and Girls Club. Lastly, global recognition of being a top 50 podcast in four countries. Without further ado, let's chop it up. Hello and welcome to Chopping with Fire. You're joined with your host today, Dustin Steffi, and today is going to be a fun episode. I know we talk a lot about business. I know we talk a lot about investments. I know we talk just a lot about everything within the business and entrepreneurship world, but today is going to be fun. We're going to bring some creativity into this and something different. I don't know if you all have heard of origami, but right now I got an expert on that is the pro in origami. So I'm going to introduce our special guest expert in Ross Simmons. Ross, how are you? Hey, good new man. Thanks for having oh, me on the show. Thank you for coming on. I uh, definitely am going to enjoy this. I'm sure our listeners will too. And it's, it's just going to be some fun. Cool. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Might right. be boring as hell. <laughs> uh, man, I hope not. But if it is, it's still <laughs> informational. Cool. Let's do it. So Ross, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I am, my name is Ross Simmons. I live in Cape Town, South Africa. I grew up in South Africa in Johannesburg, moved to Cape Town in 2010. So I've been here for the last sort of 13 years and have done a couple of things on my journey. I'm 40 years old now. So I started, I studied a few things. I studied, I tried to study film. I start, tried to study design of some kind. I ended up studying computer programming. I've always had a computer in front of me. Um, and I, I've, I wasn't very good at school. I was, I was good at telling the teacher what I thought and, you know, just developed some sort of problem with authority. So I was always struggling to get my ideas across and, and just battle the school quite a lot. Um, but always dabbling with weird, random things. I mean, I, I've, I've been into music for the longest time always playing with audio programs uh, on my computer, whatever that looked like with it was like a little waveform, trying to make little animations. You remember those little flip book animations that you used to do as, as a kid at school. So I was always distracted with things that I guess you wouldn't really expect a kid to be distracted with. Um, managed to pass school, uh, went and studied for a bit. And I moved to Cape Town with a, a, a diploma in, in uh, computer programming. And I ended up working in advertising as the web developer. So building websites, applications, that sort of thing, which I still dabble with here and there. But I think working in advertising definitely set me up for where I am now. Um, and the origami thing kind of came up when I was about 20, I think it was about 21 years old. My brother asked me to learn how to fold an origami bird or, or origami crane. Um, and origami, if, you, if you're listening and don't know what it is, it's a Japanese art form. Uh, which basically uh, is the art form of taking a sheet of paper, generally a square sheet of paper, and folding using only folds, no cuts, no glue, no scissors or knives uh, to create whatever. You can create birds, you can create shoes, you can create whatever. I mean, obviously, it's it's an art form, so it, it's not the thing you're creating, but an abstraction of that. Um, for me, yeah, my brother asked me to learn how to fold one of them years ago, and I was about 21 then and I just you know it, it was just something I did whenever I had a piece of paper in front of me folded it over and over again I got really good at folding the crane which uh, which was the bird that that I first folded and then edging towards I guess 2012 and 2013 I started looking around online started finding books in you know stationary stores and, and libraries for what other designs were out there there's quite a big origami community scattered around the world um, and there's uh, there are a couple of books and and uh, there's a lot of tutorials online that you can follow on how to fold a square sheet of paper, paper into anything and 
I just wanted to document myself. At, at one point, I realized I was doing this every day anyway. I was I just had a piece of paper in front of me. I was looking forward to it when I was supposed to be, you know, building a website or putting an app live in the advertising company I was working for. I'd have my like project management project manager staring over my shoulder like, dude, are you going to finish with that piece of paper so you can put the website live kind of thing? So I think my, again, my authoritative issues there were were present as well. So I knew that I was into this thing. I knew that it was distracting me from the work I was doing. Uh, it was never a problem. I mean, it's not like I became an origami addict, but it was just something I, I would rather have been doing than than working. And in 2014, I decided I was going to get better at origami and I was going to document myself doing it. So how I approached that was I decided to do a full year project dedicated to the art of origami and getting better at it. So I set out to post one different origami or one folded figure every day of the year of 2014 uh, and post it onto Instagram. And it just made sense because Instagram at that time, 2014, was you know just when it started taking off globally and it was getting a lot of attention so for me i just wanted a digital record of whatever it was i was i was creating so day one of 365 first of january 2014 i posted my first little origami bird and then just continued posting and again i mean it was just something i was doing i wasn't telling people about it my following at that stage was you know my aunts and uncles and friends 120 to like 130 people that that i knew and I set off and, and started this project. And about four months into that year, I quit my job. I decided I had some freelance work coming in. So as a web developer and a designer, there's there's quite a lot of things that you can do um, as in a freelance capacity in terms of, you know, work. So I was just like, you know, the worst that can happen is I just have to go back and work again for somebody. So, but the, the whole time I was still, building this whole like little origami project and about eight eight months into the project i was fortunate enough to be featured on instagram on instagram's account and that was also back in the day when i say back in the day it's like nine years ago but when the instagram algorithm wasn't as you know it wasn't as um as rigid as it is now it was very much a if you posted at six in the morning and you happen to be on at six in the morning you would see that post so I just posted at seven o'clock every morning, figured, you know, most people are getting up between six and seven. First thing they're going to do is pick up their phone. And if they open Instagram, hopefully they see one of my posts. And that kind of worked as a strategy. Um, and going forward, my following slowly started increasing. I got featured by Instagram. And it was around that time that I started dabbling with um, stop motion animation. So basically, uh, Stop motion animation is uh, an animation style where uh, it's pretty much motion photography, where you're taking a series of photographs of a whatever it is, an object, and you're moving it in very small increments at once, or oh, time after time, and then taking a series of photos becomes an animation, and you tell little stories or um, whatever, just content essentially. And by the end of the year, I had close to I think it was like fifty thousand followers, which I was like, wow, how the hell did this happen? And that's when brands started approaching me because they saw, okay, cool, this guy's doing something different. He can design pretty much anything out of paper. And he's got this animation style that he's playing with as well. So let's ask him, you know, if he could create some content for us. And that was at the end of 2014, at the end of the project that I'd finished. And I just decided then I was like, you know what? No one else is really doing this on um, on a level that I am. So let's get better at it and and see how far we can take it. And that was, yeah, it was nine years ago. And so I've been a full-time origami artist um, and I guess content creator. I kind of fell into the influencer space a little bit, but I really, I don't like that word. I don't like that space. I mean, I'm not influencing anyone over here. <laughs> Just creating some, some stuff, you know. Um, but I've been fortunate enough to work with some really big brands around the world. I've worked with Red Bull. I've worked with Paramount Pictures. I've worked with um, Disney and Pixar, Disney Plus. Uh, yeah, and the list goes on. And I think it, uh, what I have on my side is I'm able to um, create short form content in a very, I guess, uh, eye catching way. Uh, it's and it also taps because origami is something that kids do. As generally, it's it's. You don't really associate doing origami with um, with anything that could be more than that. 
So when people see that, they're kind of like, wow, watch this piece of paper turn into a dragon and the dragon breathes fire on this, I don't know, pair of shoes and the pair of shoes turn into a Nike, you know, Nike boxer shoes or whatever the case is. I mean, that's my branding mind coming out there. But essentially, that's how I make money. That's how I, um, I've i been able to um, to live for the past sort of nine years. And now I just connect with, with as many creatives uh, around the world via Instagram. I do ins origami installations. So if brands need, I guess, uh, an origami installation of, let's say, a thousand butterflies or um, a hundred flowers, I've got a team that I work with. We all design whatever it is that the, the brand or the client wants. And I will then uh, show this team of mine how to fold whatever that figure is. We fold hundreds of them and that becomes the installation which gets put up on a wall or in a gallery or uh, in a retail store, whatever the case is. That's the one side and then the the animation and, and content creation side as well. It's a lot to unpackage, a lot of uh, yeah. <laughs> talent and a lot of creativity there. A um, couple of things that came out that I wrote down here. Uh, consistency is key. And uh, in your story, the one big pattern that I saw anyway, and I'm sure you you understand this more than most, is the more consistent you are, the more that things take off. And so I saw that kind of within your story, uh, with with your Instagram, with your origami, with just about everything that you were talking about. Another thing that came up that um, kind of alerted me a little bit was the term influencer, which <laughs> I'll I'll use it loosely as well too. It's not it's not the the best term to use, right? Because I mean, you're right. Sometimes we feel like we're not influencing people, or we feel like what we add value to isn't really influence. It's just we're doing what we like. However. Mm -hmm. I want to um, kind of take note that you are still an influencer no matter what, because your, your work and what you do does impact other people and whether or not they're telling you that they're influenced by you or not is, is irrelevant because you are influencing people. And a good example of that is just how many people you've built your business to for, for getting origami out there or even educating on origami or your work just being shown and flourished, your Instagram following just blowing up, whatever the case may be, you do you do influence in some shape or form. So uh just wanted to kind of give you credit where credit is due, you know? And then uh Another thing that I wrote down that was kind of key was your tipping point is what I call it. So you're working your normal job and you're kind of embodied into this hobby that you like. And all of a sudden it's just like, man, I'd rather be doing this than working my nine to five. Not to say that the nine to five was bad, or anything along those lines, you just recognized ahead of time where you can add more value. And I just think that that's so super important because I think in this day and age, uh, people get stuck and they forget what they're good at or what they want to do. And they kind of just stay in the role that they're in instead of taking a chance on branching out. Yeah, absolutely. It's look, I mean, it's, it's a very, I would, I have to say it's a, it's a privileged position to be in because, you know, I don't know what percent of the world are, are able to sit in a job that they don't really like and be like, you know what, I'm going to go fold paper for a living. I, I mean, I didn't do it exactly like that, but um, I recognize that it is something that not everyone would have the opportunity to do, but I think there are practical steps that you can take uh, regardless of your uh, situation maybe look i said regardless but i think there are definitely ways of going about it I, the one thing i did was i didn't just quit my job i mean it's not like i didn't have any money i didn't walk out you know pulling a zap sign at my boss saying like thanks for nothing asshole you know it wasn't like that at all i i made sure that i built up a relationship and a network of people that should this thing that i wanted to do be it 
be a freelancer or start a business, should it not work out that I can still go back to these people and say, look, this didn't really work out for me. Do you have a job for me? And that was one thing I did. Another thing I did was I saved up enough money uh, just to basically make sure that I had all my bases covered for the next, I think, I think I had about three months of what my current salary was saved up and I'd saved that up over time. And I always, I've been pretty good at saving. So I always have this little, you know, I don't want to say nest egg, but it was just enough to keep me going. And, and that has just, you know, that that's just a habit that I got into just in case, cause you don't know, it's a rainy day fund. You don't know what's going to happen. And you also don't know when you want to make a drastic decision, like quitting your job or whatever the case is. Um, so there are, there are definitely those things that you can, that anyone who's sitting in a job that they don't like, um, and who is, you know, watching videos on how to make shoes or, uh, watching woodwork videos or, you know, trying to create content on the side or making animations, stuff that it, one thing that always just sat with me was, um, try and pay attention to the thing that, or, or listen to the thing that you are doing when you're supposed to be working. So if there, whatever that thing is, like for me, it was, it just happened to be origami. So, and I paid attention to it. I just, I had, I also had the guts to go, okay, well, let's see how far I can push this thing. And I think that as, as a creative or a business owner, you, you have to take that chance. Um, and you just owe it to yourself because, you know, you, you're going to look back 10 years from now, 20 years from now and be like, well, damn, I could have actually really done something. I could have done something different and not to say that it's too late, but you could have saved yourself a lot of time. Um, so that was just always for me, you know, in the back of my mind, always been able to go back to, to work if I did need to. Uh, fortunately, I haven't had to. I've done some, you know, some web development stuff on the side just to, yeah, pay the bills when there's there's not too much work coming in. And I just I just dare to do something different. And, and no one sets out to become an origami artist or maybe even a stop motion animator um, or a content creator for that matter. It just, I just worked out, cool, that's the space I'm in. Um, and I just started doing as much as possible. And I, I maintain that, you know, just keep on, like you say, consistency, just making sure that I'm always creating, making sure I, I feel I, for, for lack of fully knowing what my purpose is. I mean, I don't think I'm really, I've ever really searched for a purpose, but if I had to link that to something, it would be to create, I, I'm here to make things. I'm here to make, um, whether it's conversation or origami or animations or content, whatever the case is. Um, and I just dedicate my time when I don't know what to do. And then when, the, when there's not a lot of work going on, I'm like, let me just make something. And that kind of gets me out what it gets something out and pushes me forward to the next step. You've built something amazing here too. I mean, as you said, prior to this, you, you've had, you've been afforded the ability to work for big companies doing what you love, like Red Bull, like Disney, Sony Converse. I mean, you've gotten to do some fun things that, a lot of people dream of so i mean it's been rewarding like to branch out actually in my opinion looking at what you're doing and it's paid off uh creativity i think is something that separates us out from technology and computers right like the human aspect of creativity you can't get it at, well I say this loosely, you can get a computer to do it, but you have to program and code it to do it. Right. Whereas hum humans can free think. So there's a lot of like off the cuff, quick creative things that you can do. And so that kind of leads me into a question for you, which is with technology advancing as fast as it is and creativity being so important, do you, see a threat to human creativity with AI coming out or any of this new technology? Like what's your take on that? I think that I've always just approached any technology, uh, any new technology, particularly as a um, something I can uh, try to understand something I can potentially be friends with and, and uh, maybe use in whatever I'm doing. Um, I've never, I've never thought, okay, cool. Well, you know, 
here comes this new camera or here comes AI and it's it's going to threaten the work that I do. I know that I a lot of people don't, particularly creative people, don't share that sentiment. <laughs> I've had many conversations uh, with with a lot of creatives and artists who are they they genuinely feel like this is the end for them, designers and uh, 3D animators and artists, and I understand where they're coming from, but I would rather, and I'm not saying that it's not going to happen. I'm not saying that uh, all, all the work I do is, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can't imitate it or no piece of technology is going to be able to, to do what I can do better than me. I will never say that because I've seen, you know, I've, I've seen the exact opposite, but I would rather learn and understand how these tools work and add them into my workflow and my process so that I can advance and I can show others how it's potentially um, possible to use this kind of technology. So uh, do I see it as a threat? Not at all. I see it as a, I see it as a, a means to create something new, uh, put some, some very unique stuff out into the world. And I, and there's a lot of people on, on Instagram. I mean, for, when I started with the whole origami thing, I was connecting with, Firstly, the origami community on Instagram and anyone starting anything will be, you know, you'll find your, your little, your tribe on Instagram. It's like with anything, you know, whether you're into vaping or tattoos or shoes or whatever, there's little, these little clusters, these little subgroups that are, are there. And I'm now connecting with the um, augmented reality and the virtual reality and the, the AI community. And it's amazing because it's, it's taken me all the way back to like how I felt at the beginning of my, I guess, my digital journey, which has been through origami, because a lot of this stuff is, uh, it's all centered around these new tools that are, are now available and the rate at which you can create stuff. And people are getting super excited about it. And I just want to be part of that energy. I want to be part of that excitement because it's, to me, it just makes sense. And again, I'm I'm speaking for myself and the, the people that I'm connecting with and speaking to feel the same. They, we're having the same conversations, but does, it's not everyone's sentiment for sure. I mean, I, there, there was an Instagram post I posted um, a couple of weeks ago, well, it was about two months ago, of what uh, origami, it was like what origami cars would look like. So if you had to take origami and blend them with like a Hummer or a BMW or a Ferrari, um, using AI to feed that through, you know, whatever text to image generation program. I think I was using mid journey at that stage. And I got a lot of people messaging me saying, you know, dude, been following you for the last eight years now, but I'm out. Can't believe you're supporting this system and can't believe you using the, and I, and I get it. I understand it's, it's not for everybody, but you know, there was a quote I read and I've been saying this quite a lot is, uh, resisting technology doesn't slow its progress so you can hate it all you like but it's like it's you know it's going to leave you in in the dirt so you might as well understand it know that it's going to be the future and and just try and put it into your workflow that's that's just how i think about it another thing that came up that i think is so critically important for this podcast and for you because you've done it is you've had all these big brands approach you to do origami uh for them how did you get in the door with some of these big businesses like for my small entrepreneurs that kind of don't know how to get in and blow up a little bit you have so what's the secret is there a secret or did it just yeah. happen <laughs> oh man that old thing i you know what they, for me it was it wasn't one thing i think my my attitude just remained very positive I, you know, there were times where I was running out of money and I was like, well, this is getting, you know, bad now. But all I would do in those times was like, just make stuff. I would make and put out, make and put out, make and put out and try and connect with, I mean, the number of podcasts, the number of agencies, the number of um, creatives and brands and companies that I sent my work to is it's staggering. I, I remember keeping a list of like, he has 50 agencies that I sent my stuff off to in New York and then LA and London and, and Sydney. So I was just always um, in the process of sending my stuff out. And, and even though I didn't get much of a response directly, um, down the line, someone would say, hey, you know, we saw your stuff here and we'd love to work with you on, on this project. But I just felt that, um, you know, just over time, 
using the channels that I, I had available to me um, and sticking to my strengths. Not There were times where I thought, okay, cool, well, I'm going to do this. I, an example is I was into hobby electronics for quite a while, like Arduino and Raspberry Pi and whatever. It was just a very, um, I guess, small group of, well, it, it's now it's like a, quite a big thing, but I try to go down that route and I try to create a business or see how I could blend that into what I was doing. And it didn't really work, but um, and I realized in that moment or, or during that time that I needed to stick to what I was kind of good at and what I was known for and then see slowly how I can branch off from that in the same way that I'm doing it now with, with AI and virtual reality and, and that whole space. I tried it with the NFT thing. I, um, you know, I try to get into creating NFTs and because that was, you know, that was the, the thing before AI. And I, I think that just trying those things and and trying to just understand whether they were for me or not and seeing if i could get it you know into my workflow and workflow and process that i did, again it was just something I, i'd always done but if you are starting out a business and you are starting out a, a creative venture just um you have to be patient it's something that that's something you really have to um a skill that you have to learn patience tenacity and consistency just keep putting it out there and and just tell people, tell everybody what you're doing. I remember telling people that I was an artist. Like there's there's a weird line where you kind of like, you go from working for somebody to becoming a freelancer or an entrepreneur or an artist where you have to start calling yourself that. And what, what you, you know, at what point do you decide that that is? And the, soon, the sooner I did that, the sooner I was like, okay, cool, I'm an artist now. And when people ask me, what do I do? I'm, a, I'm an artist. I still didn't believe it at the time. I was like, I'm not an artist. I'm just, you know, I'm just telling people this because just so that I can almost uh, manifest this whole, uh, I guess, um, persona that I, maybe not persona, but just this idea of, cool, I want to be an artist and I'm doing creative work. So I might as well start calling myself an artist now. And now I'm sitting on a podcast talking to you as an artist. So and a creative entrepreneur so it's like and i tell people that i'm like yeah i'm a creative entrepreneur i started this thing do this i've got this brand uh so just tell people what you're doing and and um some people are going to love your stuff and some people are going to hate your stuff uh you know try and focus on the the positive feedback but also listen to where the negative feedback is coming from um and surround yourself with people that are going to tell you the truth because i think that that's also it's something that a lot of people get a little bit wrong they come up with this idea everyone around them can see that they're so excited about this thing and they're just like oh man i'm gonna do this thing but they know that maybe they're a little bit naive and everyone around them is like yeah okay, cool man well good luck with that <laughs> um but if those people aren't telling you the truth and saying listen maybe you need to rethink this or maybe is there no other way that you can go about doing this uh, then you just end up, you know, lying to yourself and, and believing that you can. Yeah, I mean, I'm all about self belief, and I'm all about going to get, going to go do the thing and and make it happen. But honesty with yourself and honesty from the people around you is is critically essential as well. That was a lot to unpackage there too. I mean, there was a lot of things I wrote down in in that. So uh, basically, to recap that, just for everyone that's listening visibility is key and uh ross made himself visible he got his work out to as many people as he could and that snowballed into something positive there uh which leads into using your resources so whatever resources you have use it tell everybody like he said i think that's super critically important uh stay positive Yes, I think that's a humongous one because there are times, even for me in this podcast and even for you, I'm sure, Ross, like, where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I, <laughs> I'm, I, I don't know if, if I can put food on the table, I might have to do something different, whatever the case may be, where there's a will, there's a way stay positive. Um, slow and steady wins the race. I mean, that's been something I've been told since I came out of the womb. So I think that's. <laughs> critically important and most importantly i feel you brought this up too patience is key like being patient and i'm not i'm not the most patient person but i've learned over time through having my daughter and this podcast like patience patience is important you develop it it's a skill 
And for some, it's hard. For others, it's easy. But whatever the case may be, patience is important. I'm a I'm a Star Wars buff, so everything that yeah. uh, has been brought up has reminded me of uh, like the Mandalorian, right? You know, this oh, yeah, is yeah. like this like this is like, the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so uh, in the late great Mandalorian, I'm going to go ahead and use that soundboard right now. <laughs> this is the way. This is the way. Here we go. This is the way. <laughs> and yes, this is the way. <laughs> so I'm I'm pretty pretty excited about that because I think right there, those just that little three to five minute blurb right there is so critically important for anyone that's going into entrepreneurship or that is in entrepreneurship that is really trying to find that success so um ross i i appreciate you bringing your spazazz into that because i think mm. the more people For that sure. say it the more important it is to just kind of write those down write a note every day like stay positive do this do that one thing at a and time focus exactly and, and also if it feels kind of silly because you know it, it does feel you know when you when you like fake it till you make it and you just keep being positive. Like it comes a point where you're just like, I can't do this shit anymore. I'm like, you know, it, it gets difficult. But I also think that you, you, you've you got, like I said, be honest with yourself and, and let the people around you be honest with you as well. But also that whole giving up thing, I think that sometimes, like I said, I had to go back and do, you know, website work at, at some point when there, you know, there wasn't much, it was actually just before uh, COVID hit. So there wasn't much content creation work going on, but people needed websites, people needed stuff to get done on, on the internet. So I had that skill, fortunately, and I humbled up and and just decided, cool, I'm, I'm going to put my name out there again for that. And and that kind of carried me through for the, for the year and a half that, uh, that COVID was here. Um, and I, I bring that up as an example, because I didn't feel like I had given up on my dream of being a freelancer or entrepreneur or creative entrepreneur or artist at all. I just knew that that was a means to an end. And I think that you can do that as an entrepreneur in the meantime as well. So make sure that the skills that you have, I mean, sometimes you just got to take a chance and be like, you know what, I need to put the next two, three months of all my time into this. Otherwise it's not going to survive. But if you have the luxury of having money coming in from somewhere else, keep the other thing that you have as a side hustle. If it's your main gig, then find another way to supplement your income if you can. I mean, that, at the end of the day, it's just about, it's it's money that needs to keep you going. And and money, believe it or not, is very inspirational. Like it'll keep you going. Like if you if you know that you've got money, I found this again with with when I was doing web development work was like the, the work that I, I knew I didn't have to worry too much about the, the bit of money that was coming in. And I could focus more creatively on the other things that I wanted to do. And as a result of that, more work uh, started coming in um, on, on the content creation and, and animation side. So, yeah, I mean, that's just a bit of, bit of advice there. Just don't give up on your dream, but also don't think that uh, just because you have to go do the old thing that you did or something else for the next three or four months or year that you've given up on it. If you believe enough in it, then it will happen. But just, yeah, just take it easy on yourself, get out of your own way and and be patient as well, yeah. You brought up a good point with money. Uh, most entrepreneurs, the biggest the biggest thing I hear is, they're trying to make enough money to live a comfortable lifestyle, right? But I think that's such a broad thing because what's comfort What's comfort mean mm -hmm. to you? Everybody's definition of comfort is different. I mean, if I'm living check to check, but I'm living, is that comfort? Is that comfort? Or is comfort having uh, half a million dollars in the bank account? You know what I mean? So with mm -hmm. that being said, as an entrepreneur for you, has it taught you, especially in this day and age where inflation is very real, has it taught you how to manage your money better? Like when you quit your nine to five and you went to this, I'm pretty certain you were in a comfort comfortable lifestyle with that nine to five and then shifting over to this. You are your own boss, which means you're your own finance person as well, too. <laughs> How yeah, exactly? 
how did that shift look for you and how did you adjust how did you get comfortable um really i mean you and i didn't talk about like if you're a millionaire or not and and i may not know maybe you are a millionaire but like obviously (laughs) (laughs) me neither don't worry but obviously (laughs) there is a sort of kind of skill that you have to have in managing money to make this work and to keep being an entrepreneur how does that look for you I think something I've always been very good at and whether it's something I learned from, you know, my family or uh, a skill that I picked up along the way was I always knew how to keep a little bit on the side, you know, just have a little bit saved, have enough um, and and also just be humble when, you know, if you need to ask for money or if you need to, hopefully that you, you've created an environment around yourself where you do have some, I'm not saying having access to someone else's money. But if you need to go sleep on someone else's couch because you can't afford the rent, make sure that you have at least two or three people whose couch you can go sleep on, you know? Um, and that is, that, that's how, if you listen to a lot of um, the Silicon Valley, Valley stories, like those guys, they ate noodles and ramen and slept on somebody's couch for years sometimes. And not to say that that's how drastic it has to be. Um, and there's also this this idea around you know, being an entrepreneur and money and because entrepreneurship essentially is about starting your own business and making as much money as possible. You know, it's, you can add purpose and cause and whatever to it, but the, the main goal of any, of any uh, journey on, on, in that space is to make money. Um, and maybe you've got this goal of like, cool, well, this is what I'm, what I'm aiming at and what I want to achieve with my life in terms of finances. But I don't think that it's, that it's a re like for me, it's not a reality. It's not, it's not something that, okay, cool. When I hit a million dollars in my bank account, that is when X fill it in, when I'm going to be happy, when I'm going to be satisfied, when I find my purpose. Um, And I think there is this misconception of that. I'm not saying that because I've reached that, but I just approach money with a a very, um, I see. And I don't know if this is like everyone's way of going about it, but the way I see money, I see it as a resource and an energy and a, and sometimes a friend because it's a friend that sometimes I see quite regularly and it's nice to hang out with him and we, we you know, talk shit and it's great. And sometimes he's not there and sometimes like I miss him. And the thing is, I know that I just need to be comfortable with who I am and comfortable enough to know that at some point he will come back. Um, and treating it like that is, it, it might seem a little bit childish and, and naive, but it honestly has worked for me. I just, I see it as this, this energy, this entity that just comes and goes sometimes. Sometimes I make a lot of money and I'm able to save it. I treat it with respect when it does come in, I celebrate it. I'm like, cool, this is amazing. But just knowing that regardless of what it feels like now, when look, if you're really running out of money and you need to take a loan, I mean, that's what you need to do. That's, that's the reality of the situation. But I think that you can avoid that by, so just cutting back on a couple of things in your life. You're like, well, we're eating out a little bit too much or can't afford to go do that holiday again or whatever the case is, just finding places in, there's another quote that I, I really love. It's, it's stealing, uh, how did you put it? It was, you have to learn to, steal time from comfort and when you are comfortable is when you have enough resources you've got enough money you've got some money in the bank work's coming in and it's great and it's what you're doing in that time and and how you steal more time from that comfortable space to set your life up so that you don't arrive in that situation again down the line where you, you don't have any more money and you run out of time and you're like oh and you start freaking out and it's stressful and you have anxiety and these, these are normal Western problems. You know, these are things that I speak to so many people about. Not enough money, too much stress, too much anxiety, can't sleep. The, just, there's a whole bunch of stuff that that kind of piles on as a result of that. But just learning how to live, um, I guess live, not trying to just keep up with the Joneses and, you know, there's that whole analogy. It's not, there's always going to be more to get and, and you're never fully going to be satisfied or you're never going to be permanently satisfied with your situation unless you are okay with who you are. I mean, I can go go down this whole, you know, the journey that I've done internally and, and spiritually almost like um, sorting out 
to my relationship with myself. I think that was the the biggest favor I've ever done for myself. I'm still on the path and I'm still, I don't get things right all the time, but knowing what I'm good at, knowing what I'm not too good at and working towards um, trying to be better than I was yesterday. And that's definitely helped me. I, I will admit it, it's helped me understand money a little bit better. It's helped me understand relationships with people. And I think all of that kind of filters into the same thing. Um, and yeah, just, you know, how, how some people approach the whole thing and like this whole hustle culture and you got to get the shit done. You've got to be working 16 hours a day and you've got to be stressed out and you can't, can't be sleeping. I think that's something that we've all just bought into for whatever reason. And I just choose not to because it, it I don't think it serves anybody, especially being a creative person myself, you know, like I need time to sit and do nothing for long periods of time because and in those periods i need to make sure that i'm relaxed because if i'm not ideas are not going to rock up and if ideas don't rock up money is not going to rock up so that's just how i approach it i'm kind of like just relax chill out you know leave some time for myself um and don't stress and the times where i think i need to be working or where i feel i'm forcing myself to do stuff that's when i just step back a bit um, and just say okay cool let me go you know do a yoga session or drink a beer or something and just relax and, and ease into the day. Yeah. I think everybody has a different relationship with money, right? I, my relationship with money is different than your relationship with money, but the fact of the matter, like you brought up is you have to learn, like you said, to steal time from comfort, to be able to balance things out and make things work. Uh, pride, is the other thing that I wrote down. That was a big word that I wrote down in what you were discussing. You have to set aside your pride to be able to ask for help if you do need help because mm -hmm. success isn't created off of your pride. Success is created off of, well, being able to ask for help and have others in the fold. So yeah. I don't know any single entrepreneurship or I'm sorry, I don't know any single entrepreneur that has done it completely and totally on their own i haven't met one yet so there's always someone that is an inspiration or help or whatever the case may be so that's some good important stuff there i appreciate you talking about that and that journey a little bit uh something that came up question that came up from one of the listeners was they're using social media to be able to drive their business However, they're not getting that reach that they want. And it seems like you kind of have created that reach. What are some what are some key suggestions that you may have for the listeners that are like looking to expand their social media to get that reach to really drive their business? To be honest, for me, I think it was I I didn't really focus too much on you know, how do I grow this thing? How does it get bigger? Uh, it just organically just happened. And I think uh, a large part of it was firstly connecting with the smaller community, which was the origami community. And that spilled over into the local Instagram community, which was like origami, oh, sorry, yeah, the um, uh, Instagram Cape Town and Instagram South Africa. And it just kind of grew from there. So start small, uh, you know, everybody wants to launch a product and have, you know, a thousand followers by the end of the day, and then by the end of the week, 10,000, and then they, you know, they're killing it with sales by the end of the month. That that's that doesn't happen. Maybe it does. Maybe you write some piece of AI code that, you know, spills out into the world and, and causes that. That's cool. That's that's amazing. But for the most part, for 99% of people, I think it's it is a long hard, it's a it's a struggle. And it doesn't have to be I, I say struggle, it doesn't have to be a negative struggle like struggle to me i enjoy struggle sometimes i think that that I, i've been and you know back to the whole stealing comfort from um or stealing time from comfort being uncomfortable is a sign for me that i'm growing a sign that i am progressing in some way and i am learning along the way as well but in terms of putting stuff out there just you you it, it's also 
very it's this whole thing of you know you think that okay cool well if, as soon as i get 10,000 followers it's the same as the money thing as soon as i get money then i'll be happy as soon as i get 10,000 followers then i'll start making more money but it doesn't work like that it, and and something i i got told early on was um before anything sort of happened for me uh someone said just focus on your they've got that whole thousand true fans analogy which is focus on the people that started following you first that support what you do that are always asking you questions about what you're doing don't ignore them regardless of who you think they are because it's those people that are going to support you when you decide to change or when you decide that you know what this is not really for me um so focus have have that person or that, that group of people in mind top of mind all the time i mean it's easy to think okay cool i just want to reach out to a million people because then my life is going to be better then i'm going to sell more then i'm going to make more money but that is also not a reality. And it's also, I mean, it's a very attractive thing. It's like, it's nice to have a little blue tick and, you know, like 10 million followers on your Instagram profile because it, it, it feeds your ego on, it, on multiple levels. And that also can turn into money if you know how to do it properly. But I know people who have 5,000 followers on Instagram who are killing it. And I know people that have a million followers and don't know how to make money from it. So, you know, it, it's... It, it's a very um i guess it, it comes down to you as a as a person and how you want to approach the whole thing but focus on the people that have started supporting you from the beginning and try and develop a an, an understanding of what it is they want from you and focus on that thing and produce more of that because that is how if somebody wants something from you chances are two people that they know also want the same thing and if you enjoy what you're doing plus people that you don't know and don't really know want to buy something from you or want to get something from you then you're doing something right uh, but this this idea of oh yeah 100,000 followers you must be killing it you must be making a lot of money it's like nope it's not like that at all um and it, it's a misconception but not to say that you shouldn't you know try and gain a following if you want to do like the technical hardcore like go down and and really try and uh, grow your audience that that comes down to being on Instagram all the time, connecting with a smaller community, liking posts, commenting on posts, sharing people's stuff, reaching out to people via their DMs and saying, hey, I really enjoy which, but asking questions that are not like, hey, do you want to collab? Because that, that <laughs> man, the number of messages I get like that, like, oh, do you want to collab? Yeah, that's not, okay, cool. Well, what's, what are we going to do? And they're like, well, I was hoping that, you know, maybe you had an idea of how we could make some, like, look, if you've approached me to come up with an idea, then you're asking me to work for nothing. And, you know, if you want me for my whatever, my little bit of influence that you think I have, then you've come to the wrong place. But if somebody comes to me and says, hey, listen, I love what you're doing here. And I, this has happened to me recently. I love what you're doing here. And I would love to work with you. Here's an idea that I have. Are you keen to do it? Then it's like, of course, yeah, I'd love to entertain that. And, if you know, if it does turn into money or something, then it's like, cool. But if it doesn't, then no big deal. Ross, you want to collab? <laughs> let's collab, man. Yeah, let's, whatever. Do you have let's any ideas? Collab. Yeah, yeah. I have a million of them. Let's do it. No, I uh, I agree with you. I get I get those messages all the time too, and I'm like, okay, you want to give me something a little more tangible to go off of here? Like, what what value? This is my big thing, right? And this is, here's my key knowledge bomb of the day. What value do you bring to the table to make whatever said collab successful? That's what I'm looking for. Because in my mind as an entrepreneur, I'm looking to try to get any net win that I can to be successful. And if I'm collabing with someone, so like you and I are collabing right now, right? This podcast is a collab of you and I this episode what value is it going to bring well it's going to bring value to my listeners that. of what knowledge you've dropped into it for you it's going to give you a reach that's different than what you have because my reach is different from your reach so it's going to give a different reach like there has to be a net win in the universe for the universe to keep going in my opinion You still there, Ross? Uh, 
There you are. You. What happened? Probably my internet, not yours. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Um, so we're still on record. Where did it cut off? I can't hear you, man. If you are speaking, I, <laughs> I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Hear me? Yeah, there we go. Can you, yeah. There Perfect. We go. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Cool. Where did it where did it cut off? Um you asked me if I wanted to collab. And then it just cut off from there. Yeah, I just stopped. <laughs> Damn it. It was like yeah, yeah, yeah. awesome. Did you say uh, I'll just cool. recount it in. Lucky I can edit a lot of things, so good deal. Okay, cool. Um no problem. So uh I'll just count in five, four, three, two, one. So Ross, the big thing that I have right now is, do you want to collab with me? <laughs> Let's collab, man. What's your idea? Oh man, I have millions of them. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> where do we start? But no, <laughs> in all actuality, I relate with you, which is I get the messages too. Do you want to collab? And it's like, okay, what? added value do you bring to the table for us to be able to collab so what i'm looking for and a good example is what you and i are doing right now i have a different reach from what your reach is so us collabing on my podcast and giving these knowledge bombs to not only my listeners but also posting this for your for your following is going to create a different avenue for us to create a win-win and to answer questions and to help others. So for me, it's all about what value do you bring to the table for us to have a successful collab? If you're going to approach me and be like, do you want to collab? I'm my first initial response is going to be no, because <laughs> you're not, you're not giving me any value. Like, like, give me something, give me something to run off of where it's enticing for us to be able to create a collab together. So I agree with that statement that you made and I uh, empathize with you because I, I know I get a million messages that say that and it's like, okay, cool. So what are we doing? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, I mean that, although that is, like I said, you, you really do have to put yourself out there and you have to ask, but don't just ask because you think that they are going to respond, whoever that person is. Um, Another thing on, on the opposite end of it is also just realize that those people that you're reaching out to, regardless of who it is, let's say there's somebody in the, I don't know, the sneaker space that has a couple of hundred thousand followers and you really admire what they're doing and you're this up and coming sneakerhead and you want to do something with them or whatever, but you do genuinely have an idea and you're super humble and you're like, cool, I'm going to come up with this pitch and do the whole thing. Reach out to them because you must remember that at the end of that DM is just one person. You know, although it's a company maybe, but at the end of the day, it's one person that you're dealing with and build a relationship with that person. And building a relationship doesn't mean that you are going to get something from it, um, but be genuine about it start a conversation say this is what i'm doing um if at some point there is something that i can contribute towards or maybe you in this place and we can meet up whatever do that that is something that i think that uh, not enough not enough people do but just have zero expectation i think expectation is also another thing that you know you've, you've also got to put aside it's kind of like just sending your work and putting your work up and expecting it to uh you know draw more followers or work or money into your bank account i think that that is a is a big flaw and being you know in the millennial space like uh, that's the disease of our time man is expectation and um and entitlement it's like oh well i've got this so i deserve that and then you can bitch and moan and kick and scream about like a little kid as much as you like but it, it doesn't entitle you to anything you have to do the work and the work is whatever it looks like from from your end it's like it's it's being humble just sticking to your craft 
whatever your craft is, getting good at it until people started approaching you. That's that's one thing I, I did. I didn't do it actively. It was just something that I happened to do. I just focused so much on getting better at this thing because I just obviously had this thing inside me. It's like, I just want to get better at this thing. And I had enough of an interest in it to want to do it more and more and more. So whether it was folding a piece of paper or creating an animation or making a piece of music, whatever it was, I, I just I just was obsessed with getting better at it for myself, you know, regardless of what feedback I was getting. It was nice to get feedback. It's nice to have a couple of thousand followers, you know, the next day uh, in your account. But I, I, I tried very hard not to let those metrics drive me. Uh, and I think that that served me well up until now. You know, you bring up a good point because... I feel expectation leads to pride and I'm guilty of this because when I graduated with my undergrad, me being a millennial and all, as you <laughs> so kindly stated, um, <laughs> I, I thought, and I think this leads back to high school. So I'll get into it. But I thought after I graduated with my undergrad, I was going to make buku money. And I, it was an expectation that I would, mm -hmm. I would make said money. But what I didn't realize was there that getting my education was a key puzzle piece to the greater puzzle of getting that experience within said industry to be able to make that money. Now, in my older age, I understand it and get it, but at that time, it's funny that you brought that up because I did expect more than I I think I deserved, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we're conditioned in that way, to be honest with you, Ross, because in high school, when I was in high school, at least, I don't know how it is now, they were driving the point, if you go to college, you'll make X amount. And if you get your master's, you'll make X amount. And if you get your doctorate, you'll make X amount. So they kind of drove that into your brain a little bit to create that entitlement. I also think entitlement leads to pride as well too. Mm -hmm. And man, did I have a big ass chip on my shoulder when I graduated? <laughs> 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 but I mean, these are all valid points and these are all very real points. And so I just, I wanted to bring kind of some of my, some of my experience into that because I too did fall for that bug, but I do realize now it, it isn't about the education. It isn't about pride. It isn't about any of that. It's about consistency. It's about continuing to do the right things all the time. And eventually if you keep going, things will fall into place. There there's always something that falls into place. It may not be, instant gratification because that's the culture we're in right now let's be realistic instant gratification it isn't instant gratification you have to put the work in and take the time to do it and perfect your craft before you can move forward yeah exactly fall, fall in love with making fall in love with the process fall in love with the journey because if you don't and uh, you know i said fall in love with it it seems like this Oh, you've got to find your passion and you've got to, that's also another whole loaded sort of school of thought. Like you've got to find the thing that like you wake up, I, I don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, man, I get to fold some paper today. Or I get to animate some shit. It's like, there's sometimes I am excited about jobs, but it's, I, I honestly don't wake up feeling like that. I, there's mornings where I wake up and I'm like, oh, I'm going to make something today. I'm not even sure what it is, but I, I get this urgency to make something and then i'd set down the path of cool can i keep this inspiration going can i fall asleep tonight wake up tomorrow morning with the same thing still have the idea and still keep on doing that uh, and then attempt to make that thing and when work comes in it's kind of like okay that gives my i guess my inspiration a bit of time to you know build up again because then i'm focused on the job and the work and i need to get it done and the times where i'm working and i've got like long stretches of six seven week jobs where at the end of it, I'm, I feel inspired. I'm tired, but I feel like, okay, cool. Well, I get a chance to make something next, make something that comes from me. That doesn't necessarily, um, sometimes there's jobs where I'm just like, wow, this is amazing. I did, I did a, a job for um, the Pixar or, or Disney plus job where I had to, they wanted to make an origami version of the, or a stop frame animation as well with 
the up house you know the little house from up with the balloons and whatever yeah i love and that house my daughter does too <laughs> yeah it's a, it, everyone loves the house and they asked me to do it because they were launching up um onto disney plus so it was just like this resurgence of the content and you know for me that was just an amazing job because it was something i grew up with something i i um i watched many many times and i loved it so sometimes you get those jobs where it's just full passion and you just like and that's again that's just a graceful thing that happens um but so you know falling in love with the process and and really waking up every day and but and i think entrepreneurs sometimes do this as well they where they maybe convince themselves that they love the hustle they love going to bed at like 2 a.m in the morning waking up at six and then just grinding again bullshit you are not a functioning or a fully functioning human being if you're doing that day in and day out and i know there's a lot of people that that are really promoting and they, they're driving this whole hustle culture and i think it's it's a it's a problem because no one is really because especially they're not seeing the instant gratification they're not getting the results they come from a place of expectation and privilege and um well, maybe not privilege but expectation and and um uh what's the word lost it now anyway uh it's you just hope that this happens all the time and as a result of that when the thing doesn't come to you straight away then you get all bummed out and you're like oh well you know then the world's the problem uh, and it's it's nothing that you're doing obviously you deserve to get all this you you have a doctorate in or maybe not a doctorate but you have some qualification that you've been led to believe is going to allow you a certain amount of money and also a specific lifestyle but how many people does that happen for? And if uh, what I was going to say about that whole thing is, if you look at the amount of student debt in in America, I mean, that's something that just is it's it's crazy. So if if they were telling everyone at schools, you know, I'm dipping into the, <laughs> the conspiracy theory here, but like if they're telling everybody at schools, they're driving this whole like you must go and study, you have to go do this thing. But the only way you can study is by taking a student loan, because they know down the line that they, that has to be paid back. How many people are in like debt and will be in debt for the rest of their lives because of the thing they went and studied and they're not even using that qualification now. I'm one of those. What, what is the, yeah, there we go. There <laughs> I'm we go. One I'm of speaking, them. <laughs> there you go, man. It's like, and I, it's, it's it, to me, it's just like, that is a, it's a clear cut case of like, well, what is actually going on here? Look, it, I think it rings a, a massive bell of um, urgency to you know to fix the education system for one and and also we're not in the industrial revolution anymore so getting a job as a typist or getting a job as even a lawyer or a doctor those jobs are not going to be there with you know back to what we were saying about ai and and um th that is going to change things and and going forward you need to be on the lookout for the machine that's going to replace either replace your job or it might not be, I've read a lot of sort of um, comments from people that are saying in different industries that it's not the AI that's going to replace your job. It's the person who has the same qualification or skills as you that has decided to use and implement AI into their process. That person is going to take your job. And when you have an engineer that comes in, an engineer that's fresh out of school, but you have an engineer that's fresh out of school that has this understanding of AI and how he can or, or she can uh, use that to better the company, that person is going to get the job, hands down. So don't be scared of AI. Be scared not to understand it. Um, you know, that's that's just my thoughts on that. I think I'm going to take that as the key knowledge bomb of the episode is don't be scared to learn about other things just because you think it's going to take your job away or whatever. Embrace it and see if you can leverage it to move forward and change with the times that are changing. Mm -hmm. So Ross, I have one last question for you, which is we've had all these interesting knowledge bombs. We've had great conversation. People resonate with people. If they want to get a hold of you, what's a good way to get a hold of you? Yeah. So Instagram, if you're on Instagram, my Instagram account is white on rice. That's the brand that I've run. That I that I essentially run some little mini origami agency, <laughs> uh, white on rice, um, white. You can Google white on rice origami. Uh, my website will come up. 
I'm on Facebook. If you want to get hold of me, I'm Ross at white-onrice.com. And yeah, I'm on LinkedIn as well. So we can chat there. But I, I answer all my comments, I answer all the DMs that I get. Um, and I look forward to speaking to people that have, you know, whether it's an idea or they just want to find out something or maybe I can help in some way. So I'm always keen to chat to people. So yeah, you can find me there. Well, you obviously know I'm keen to chat with people. I, I chat with people for a living. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. No, it's a cool job, man. And and your your show is really cool. Like I, I really like the the questions that you asked. It's it's not it's not every day that I have to think. I'm like, mm, okay, well, that's a interesting way of looking at it. So yeah, thank you for your honesty and, and energy. It's been a really cool chat. Thank thank you for coming on. Thank you for being a creative that comes on and uh just is really passionate about what they do and you have the experience to back it and kind of the knowledge to answer the hard questions. So thank you for coming on. Yeah. Anytime.